inside the gate. None of them believed it. They had been in the famine too long. And they didn't believe it. But four lepers men went on in another dimension and found out the real truth. What was the real truth? Enemies already gone. Devil's already defeated. Well, praise the Lord. How come old horse shot out my heart? There wasn't no devil there. They got there and there wasn't no devil there. Got there and there wasn't no war going on. Only thing they found was a table spread and a feast to eat at. Hallelujah. And if I could get enough of people to quit fighting the devil long enough, amen, <laughs> and quit hunting demons long enough yeah. to find out he's already defeated and he's already left the scene, praise the name of the Lord. i tell you what will happen. They get to eating. Get to eating what's on the table. Can you say amen? The man of God said about this time tomorrow we're going to eat barley and flour. They have been eating ass head and doves dung. Not bad enough to eat it, they're paying for it. Are you listening? It's bad enough the saints has to eat it, let alone to pay for it. And it's killing them what they're eating. The very meal they're being fed is what costing them their victory. But God's got four, 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 four. That's the number of creation. He got four outside the gate to say, Why well, said we here yeah. until we die? Yeah, yeah. And you better believe God got a number in this hour. God up and said, We ain't sitting in these churches, yeah. dying and starving to death. Our belly is so empty we can't even feel what we need to feel. If we sit here and die, what good is it? If we go in there, maybe they'll just make us a maybe they'll just make us a prisoner and at least feed us. They went in there and said there wasn't no enemy. Yeah. Wasn't no devil. Wasn't no mess going on. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there ain't none today yeah. in the kingdom. Yeah. I said there ain't none today in the kingdom. 
You don't have to worry about nothing. I don't care what you say it is, generation or whatever, none of that mess exists in the real kingdom of God. There ain't but one Lord over this house. Amen. And Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee must bow, every tongue confess. Father, this day, sanctify our hearing. Plug us into the glory line. Let everything that flows from our lips today flow straight from the throne room, straight from the mercy seat, straight from the Holy of Holies. God, make our mouth the oracle of God. Make our tongues pens of a ready writer. Let the ears of the saints of God come open to a whole nother frequency and level of hearing the sound of the gospel today. Let healing flow. Let let restoration flow. Let strength flow. Uh, we loose the very anointing that destroys. The yoke lifts the burden on every service that's held here today. Now and in the following one and this evening, let the people feast, feast, feast till they're fed, till the feeling. Oh, glory to God. Let the gifts operate. Let the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge operate. Give us a operation of the regulatory gifts, the vocal gifts, the power gifts in this house today. Let your people know beyond any of their knowing that they have been summoned to this place for such a time as this today. We thank you for it. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. But the Levites, 
the one that were not directly descendants of Aaron, but they were cousins and uncles and all that stuff, they had sanctified themselves. Oh, yeah. And so what wound up happening was they had to go in and do all the sacrificing because the priests weren't ready. Right. And it's the same with us. If we're not ready, if we don't have our eyes focused on Christ, we could have a feast right here in this church, and you can be sitting right in the middle of it, but you don't get to partake of it, and you don't get to do what the Lord called you to do in it, all because you're not ready. That's very true. And we sometimes in our, in our humanistic self, we hear about the feast of the Lord, and we hear about um, the sonship of God, and we expect it just to be dropped down on us, no matter where we are or what we're doing. We think we're just going to go about our own business and do our own thing, and that suddenly one day we're going to wake up and manifest as the sons of God. Now it is true it is in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But it is also true that you have to follow on to know the Lord. You have to keep walking. If you just stop, you will never get to that moment, to that twinkling of an eye when it all changes. Because it can happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but to who does he appear? To those that look for him. Yeah. If you're not looking, you're not going to see anything. Yeah. And I wanted to read in the very first verse, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to stop there because Paul was what he called, he called himself someone that was born out of season. That's right. And he had a suddenly in his life that he wasn't even looked for, and that was his salvation. That's yeah. probably about the only suddenly you'll ever get that you are not seeking God for. That the Holy Spirit will come on you sometimes in a moment. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you who once were in sin have been translated into the kingdom of right. his life. All of a sudden, what you thought you never wanted anything to do with becomes the whole goal of your life. But he didn't stop there. He went on, and he said he didn't go to see the apostles, but he went out and he went out by himself, and he allowed the Lord to teach him things, and then came back to do the work that God had called him to do. And that's what I'm talking about. And then even after that, he said, "I press towards the mark of the high calling yeah, of God yeah, in Christ yeah. Jesus." He never stopped. Right. It was always this pressing on. Why? Because the trumpet sounded, yeah. and when the trumpet sounds, it's not for you to stay in your house. And so when the trumpet sounds, it's to gather the people together. Now there were different trumpets for different reasons. Trumpets for feast, trumpets That's for right. war, trumpets to move on. That's right. Sometimes it was time for the camp to get up and move on. Yeah, move and I believe that's the trumpet that's going forth in this hour, is it's time to move forward. Yeah. Not because what you had was bad, but because there's more out there, there's yeah. more territory, more land to conquer. There's a whole other level where you go from just getting healed of sickness to walking in divine health. Yeah. From just having your needs met to not having needs anymore. That's right. There's a whole other level. But if you don't have your focus on that, then all you'll ever see is what's going on around you. And it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings yeah. in heavenly places. Now that places is added by the translators, but it's still good without it. It's, it literally means, I've looked it up in the Greek, in the heavenlies. Yeah. In Christ. Where? In the heavenlies. In Christ. And then I want us to go over to chapter 2 real quick. We may come back, but I wanted to jump over here because Paul mentions this again. In verse 6, he says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenlies in Christ Jesus. He has made us sit in the heavenlies. And what, is, um, what does the word say? He, he said, David said, uh, uh, The Lord said unto my Lord, right. Sit down here until thy enemies be made thy footstool. But where is the footstool? If it's going to be your footstool, it's got to go under your feet, right? Right. That it doesn't go, you don't take a footstool and put it up behind your head. That's right. But so many of us want to just live off of what Christ did, but we don't want to put any enemies under our feet. Now we know that in this earth, He put enemies under His feet. He put sickness under His feet. He put death under his feet, even death in his own body that he put under his feet when the Spirit worked in him to raise him from the dead. Yeah. 
He put it under his feet. He put want and lack and need under his feet. Yeah. Anytime he was um, faced with it, and not only needs for others. Now, he put needs for others under his feet. When he told the disciples, he said, you go feed them. Twice they had, over, they had thousands of people that needed food, and all they had was a little bit in their hand. And he asked the disciples to feed them, and they couldn't do it. And they said, Lord, all we have is this little bit. What is that? Even, even if we had a year's wages, we couldn't go feed these people. And so he blessed it, and he broke it, and he supplied all the need of everybody there. Every single person. Other times he supplied his own need. One time Peter came to him and said, they want their taxes, and I don't have it. And Jesus said, you go, and you go fishing, and when you pick up the fish, you look in his mouth and pull out the money, and with that, you go pay my taxes and your taxes. Amen. He supplied his own need. And he didn't have to do it through a carnal, natural way. See, there's nothing wrong if the Lord leads you to go do something. For goodness sakes, go do it. But we're so caught up in doing things on the arm of the flesh and in the flesh and natural way that we don't ever do things in a spiritual heavenly way. When it's just as available to us as the natural way. I have no problem with, you know, there's a level in which you save money and you save and you save and you save until you pay off your debts. Or you save and you save and you save until you're able to go buy the vehicle that you need or the home that you need, whatever it is that you have need of. But there's a whole other level in God when the money can come to you right then. And instead of you having to drive something that's broke down, hot, no AC, for years and years trying to save up, in a moment, it can be supplied to you exactly what you need and come to you. That's another level. Nothing wrong with the first level, but it is wrong just to stay there for your whole life and never walk in these things that God has called us to. Why is it wrong? Because we are to be the light of the world. We are to be Christ in the earth. And we can't be that if we never do what He did. If you won't do His works, you certainly won't do greater works than these. You have, you have to at least, you know, at least start walking towards it. Start believing for it. Even though you don't know when the change is going to come. Even though you're not sure when it's going to come. But if you get a heavenly outlook, what you will know is that it shall come. Whether I can see it right now or not, if my outlook is heavenly, I know that He said that as He was in this earth, so am I. And so therefore, I don't care how much sickness wants to rage in my body, it cannot stay because as he was in this earth, so am I. Therefore, no matter how much, whatever your problem you're facing, and see, that's, the, that's really the issue is that our eyes are on our problems. Before this, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 2, it says, And you have been quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. And I've told you before, lust does not just mean seeking after sin. Lust is feeling like you are without and you need something. It is that constant feeling that you never have enough. Therefore, you can be a lover of money whether you are rich or you are poor. Because the rich man who builds his barns and stuffs it full of gold and will not share with anyone that has a need is a lustful man right. and a lover of money. But the poor man that sits there and wishes and wishes and wishes and wishes that he just had more, that he just had more, never thinks he's enough, doesn't like anybody that is rich because they got something that he don't got, is full of lust. That would sell his soul if somebody would just offer him a million dollars is full of lust and a lover of money. It's not about what's in your hand. It's that feeling that you don't have enough. And that feeling will drive you so that not only in, see, sometimes we want to say, well, yes, the world's like that. And it's true, the world is like that. But many Christians are like that. They never feel like they have enough. Not just of natural things. But they even of spiritual things, they don't really believe that they have all spiritual blessings right now. 
And so they fast and they fast and they pray and they pray and they go through all these calisthenics and steps one, two, three and all these things trying to get closer to God, but they couldn't be any closer to God. Because as soon as you ask the Holy Spirit to enter in, He lives on the inside of you. Can't get any closer. And yet we've been deceived into this feeling that we don't have what we need. We don't have it, so therefore we've got to try to go get it. And because we're constantly trying to get that and our eyes are focused on that, we don't have that heavenly focus of, no, I walk in dominion now. It's not an all far off thing. It's right now. Now, I may not see it with my natural eyes, but I don't have to see it with my natural eyes. I only have to see it with my spiritual eyes. And that puts me on the pathway to it. And that's when all those problems become little. That's when you can be like Paul. And Paul, who was afflicted, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, yeah. bit by poisonous snakes, forsaken by even some of the very brethren that were supposed to be his brethren, fellow Christians right. with him, could say these light afflictions are but for a moment. For a moment. I, there is a greater glory going on in my life, yeah. and I don't care what's going on right now because I have my eyes on the greater glory. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to suffer all the time. But if you n notice, if your eyes are constantly on your needs, you suffer all the time anyways. Yes, you will. That's right. You will. You'll suffer all the time. Because even when, remember the children of Israel? They were out in the wilderness. They, they did a week's journey to the land of Canaan. They had everything they needed on the way, supernaturally brought out of Egypt, yes. supernaturally brought through the Red Sea, the commandments given to them, saw the Lord quake and fire on Mount Sinai, they get there and they still won't go in. Because they're looking at the giants. They're not looking at all the good things in the land, they're looking at giants That's in the land. Right. There's giants in the land. And because they're looking at giants, now in their own eyes, they are as grasshoppers. It changed how they saw themselves as well. So the, the Lord told them, said, now you can't go in. And they were just like a lot of Christians. When he told them to go in, they said, no, we're not going in. And when he said, fine, you won't go in, but your children will go in, they got up and tried to go in and were defeated. Hallelujah. Because no matter what God said to them, they were not satisfied and would not obey. So they go out in the wilderness, and what happens? The Lord takes care of them every single step of the way. Right. And yet, every time a need arises, they absolutely fall to pieces. They blame God, they blame Moses, they blame Aaron, and they long to go back to Egypt where they were slaves in bondage. And why is that? Because their eyes were on their needs. It was never on the Lord Most High. It was never on conquering Canaan just like he said he would. It was never on the land of milk and honey and all the things that he said they could do. It was on their need. And it's the same way in the church today. If you are need-minded, he can supply every need you have, but your mind will still be on the next need. Hallelujah. And you'll spend your whole life trying to get healed from every disease that comes your way, trying to get blessed, trying to stop being poor, trying to get your family to work, trying to get all these things to do, and you're just trying, 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 because you never see the finished work of Christ. You never look at it from a throne room point of view. See, John got the call. He said, come up hither. He told them all about the churches and what was going on in the natural, gave them their messages, and now he said, come up hither. And when he got up hither, what did he find? A throne room full of worship. A throne room full of answers. Because they came up with this scroll and nobody could open it. And John began to weep. And they said, don't weep. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's worthy to take the book and open the scrolls. And if we would get that outlook, we'd stop weeping. Because we know that the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. And if he's worthy, and he said, I made you worthy with my same worthiness, we'll figure out that we're worthy too. And that nothing can by any means harm you. I don't care how much it screams at you that it's going to do harm. I don't care how much it tells you it's going to take you out. It can scream all at once. If your mindset is, is heavenly, the Word says that He sits in the heavens and He laughs at famine. And He laughs at devastation. Because He knows there's no way it's touching His throne. 
And just like Matt told you, there's none of that in the kingdom. It just doesn't exist. All things are under our feet. Yeah. But there's, you know, the way into sonship, there's a clear path into sonship. Sonship is what the Bible talks about. You know, we, they, we compare it to the Feast of Tabernacles, where you enter into the rest of God. It's a feast where they celebrated because they had brought in the harvest for the wine and the oil. And they celebrated that. And it was a time of rest. It's a time when they got out of their house and they all came together in these booths and they celebrated. And, you know, we all like the celebration part. And we hear about sonship and it sounds good. But how do you get there? How do you see it manifest in your life? Because the thing about sonship is that it has a twofold manifestation. It has to manifest in your life individually, and then it has to manifest in the body of Christ. But some people are looking for it to manifest in the body of Christ, and yet they don't manifest it individually. Well, that won't work. We are the body. Hallelujah. We're the body. Yes. So it's, it's just like we tell you about this church. There's wonderful prophecies over this church. Great and, and grand things spoken over this church. But who's going to walk in it? All right. Individuals have to walk it out. Yeah. It's not just going, you know, we're not just going to come in here and poof, a school has been built. And all, right. all of these, you know, we're not going to walk in here one day and see that everything got done and we had nothing to do with it. Right. It's not the way it works. We enter in, and as we enter in, the whole body enters in. Yeah. But if it, no one sees... What, what is it about sonship that's so important? It is what, first of all, everyone wants to see, what do we hear all the time, in, in, mostly in churches? You know, go ye and preach the gospel unto all the world. Get people saved. They call it bringing in the harvest. Really, it's sowing the seed, but they call it bringing in the harvest. <laughs> and they think that, you know, that's it. That's our whole job. That's all we're supposed to do. But the truth is, the reason that so many sinners came to Jesus was because he was walking in sonship. And if nobody sees you walking in that, then what do they have to come to? Right. Yeah. See, manifesting the sonship of God is not just about we're great and we're wonderful and we want everybody to see us. Right. No. When you truly manifest the sonship of God, you won't care if a person knows your name or not. You won't care if they knew that that word came from you or not. That's right. You won't care if they even remember who you were. Remember when Jesus healed the man at the, the, um, at the pool? And he just left. Healed him, leaves, and they come to him and they say, Who was he? And he said, I don't know. He wasn't going around trumpeting his flesh up trying to get people to see himself. It, the, whole, the whole thing he was trying to do was to set other men free to become sons too. And that's what sonship's about. You can't set someone else free if you're not free. You can only bring them to walk in what you know. There was a place where Paul met some disciples and he said, have you been baptized with the Holy Ghost? And they said, we've never heard of such a thing. We've only been baptized with the baptism of John. Why? Because whoever taught them, that was all they knew. You can only teach what you know. But the sound is going forth for us to come up to another level. For us to teach something that is brand new to some. Glory to God. Maybe not so new to others, but brand new to some. But the way into it, you have to walk the path. You have to go through every feast. Yes. You have to go through Passover. Yes. You have to get born again. That's right. You have to have your sins washed away. Yes. Look, as you... <laughs> People take grace and they use it to go sin all the time. Right. But the truth is, if you're out sinning, you're not participating in the Passover. Amen. And sin is not about, is it good or evil? That's eating from the tree of good knowledge of good and That's evil. Right. Sin is about, does it bring life? Yeah. Because if what you are doing is causing death, and I don't care who's death, death in you, death in your family, right. death in the, those around you, death at your job, if what it's doing is causing death, then it is not of God. God is love and He can't be anything else. If it's not light, it's darkness. John's very clear about that. And if there's darkness in you, then you're not of Him yet. And that can get scary to us because we all know sometimes we don't do it right. 
But also, what I want to say, though, is that there is a place where you will always do it right. Hey. Now, that's important to know because so much of the church has settled for the two men living in the house. That's right. And they believe that's how it's going to be forever. forever. That forever, there'll be Christ in you and Adam in you. That forever you will have to deal with the two minds. Or at least on your life down here on earth. But I'm telling you, if on earth you always have Adam and Christ inside of you, then your warfare is never accomplished. And God promised Israel, the people of Zion, that their warfare would be accomplished. Yeah. So you cannot always have two men in, living in the house. And I'm not telling here to tell you that I have manifested that in its completeness, but there is a walk in God Hallelujah. where you become like Enoch. Yes, you do. And you walk with God till you're not anymore. Amen. Because you're so swallowed up in Him that there's no more of you left. Right. It does exist. And we're not supposed to just sit down here on earth and pine away till we get to heaven for it to exist. Look, God doesn't... God manifests in heaven. He doesn't need you to go there and heal the sick. There is no sickness. He doesn't need you to go there and get him out of debt. He's not in debt. He doesn't need you to bring anything to him. He's already got it all. He has it all. All he ever wanted was to plant a garden in the earth and for man to keep that garden and let it spread all throughout the whole earth. But Garden of Eden living is walking with God in the cool of the day. And Adam, before, you know, before he tasted of the good, good fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, he didn't have any sickness. No. He didn't have any shame. No. He didn't have any condemnation. He didn't have any of those things. He didn't have any sense of separateness from God. It was all oneness. And that's what God's calling us back to Him. And I'm telling you right now, you cannot be one with God completely and still be sick and still be upset and still be depressed and still have strife and all of those things. They will fall off of us the more we become one with Him. Hallelujah. But you have to, you cannot try to go back and forth between being an Israelite and an Egyptian. You can't try to live the life that Egypt lives. There came a time when he called them out of Egypt. When the Passover came, he said, get your clothes on because you're getting out of here. Amen. You're getting out of here. And, you're, and, and what else did he tell them? When they crossed the Red Sea, you're never going back. I don't care how much you want to go back. Right. I'm not letting you go back. Right. I'll let you die in the wilderness before I let I'll you go let back. You go back. That's right. I'll raise up another generation that will yeah, go in. And, I, you know, the, the wonderful thing about that is I've decided, you know, we are the gener I've decided to be a part of the generation that goes in. Yeah. See, there's, there's a twofold glory in that. One glory is that though they did not go in, they raised up a generation that went in. That's right. And that is the answer to what about all the generations before us? Yeah. You know, are we doing them a disservice by leaving behind some of the things that they believed in? Are, are we somehow... Um, defaming them or what they believe or, or belittling it. But I assure you that if they didn't go in, they want their children to go yeah, in. Right. Wouldn't you want your children to go in? I mean, if all you ever did in your whole life was bring your children to the point where they could walk in oneness with God and they walked in it, wouldn't that just thrill your soul? Yeah. It thrill mine. Yeah. To know that they were going to walk in things that I never walked in, to know that they weren't going to walk in a lot of things that I had to walk through. To know they were going to start their journey off in a place where they could live in houses they didn't build and eat from vineyards they never planted. That they could go in and be totally victorious every time they face the enemy. It's a wonderful thing. But the other, the other glory was that there were two men named Joshua and Caleb who came from the first generation and came out of it, and they believed even when nobody else believed. Yeah. Right. And believing is all that it takes. One time a man came to Jesus, and, and, and his son was tormented. And he told Jesus, he said, if you can deliver my son, that means if you can, if you will, deliver my son. Right. And Jesus turned around and said, if you can believe, oh. all things are possible yeah. to him that belief. It's never a matter can God do it. The question is, if you can believe, all things are possible. 
all things, all things, yes. any and everything you need is possible to him that believes. Hallelujah. It's all possible. You mean my whole family getting born again is possible? It's possible yes. to him that believeth. Yes. It is possible. But you have to believe. Yes. And that's what Joshua and Caleb did. They believed when nobody else believed, when everybody else was ready to stone them and kill them, they would not stop believing. They believed anyways. And because of that, 40 years later, they got to walk into the land of Canaan when nobody else from that old generation got to walk in. And they were so manifestly kept by the power of God Amen. that Joshua was well able to be the leader yes. and lead everybody with no problems. And Caleb said, I am just as strong now as I was 40 years ago. Yes. So give me my mountain. Because nothing has abated. See, there's a place where your strength will not abate. Your eyesight doesn't fade. You do not grow any older in the sense of your body just getting more aged and more aged. There is a place in God where that happens. Yes. And if they walked it out in the old covenant, there's no way that God is going to not let somebody walk it out in the new covenant. Glory to God. Because Paul said, if the ministration of death was glorious, if even under Moses and the law, when it couldn't even totally save you, all it could do was cover you for another year, was full of glory, yes. how much more glory do we have now under the ministration of grace where Christ has totally done away with all sin, yes. totally done away with all sickness, Totally done away with the curse. Yeah. Done away with it all. But we're going to have to get our eyes focused from a heavenly mindset. Yeah. We're going to have to get throne room mentalities. Yeah, because the only cure for the curse is the blessing. Yes, yeah. it is. I don't care how many band-aids you try to put on it. I don't care how many times men try to think of their ways to fix it. We have watched kingdoms rise and fall. Yeah. And why do they keep rising and falling? Because they're not full of the blessing of God. And it will, it will never be by the arm of the flesh. It will always be by his ways. Yeah. And that's why I told you that there are times that the Lord, you know, the Lord works with you where you are. He, he's, he's very merciful, very loving. He knows what level of faith you're on. He knows what level of believing you're on. And he works with you where you are. But he doesn't leave you where you are. That would be like a mother or a father or a teacher or whoever meeting a five-year-old in kindergarten and teaching them everything they need to know for kindergarten, but then leaving them there for the rest of their life and saying, no, you've got to stay here. Now, God's not like that. He'll meet you right where you are, but then he'll raise you up. And he'll keep raising you up. And the truth is, the moment you got born again, you were seated with him in heavenly places, but you have to see it. It's not just enough for God to see it because it's if thou canst believe yeah. all things are possible. Oh, it's not a question of his faith. His words are truth. He said, he said, I, I exalt my word above everything. Heaven and earth could pass away. My word wouldn't fail. Right. I have total confidence and belief in my word. Anything I send it forth to do, it accomplishes. It never returns to me void. Oh, yeah. But if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You have to be, start believing it. You have to see it. So you have to come through Passover. You have to leave behind the old ways. And that's just not sinful ways, though it does include sinful ways. But that just means your old way of doing it. Because sometimes we, you know, we think because we gave up sinning that we're good. What we can, whatever you consider sin. Because we gave it up, we're good. But the things that we think are minor, our strife, our lack of love, our tendency to always run to man instead of run to God when we have a need, Amen. all of those things, we don't like to think of those as idolatry, as hatefulness. We don't like to think about it that way, and we keep all of our little things with us. But the whole point of Passover is to get rid of all that junk yeah. and start looking only to Him. And then you've got to walk through Pentecost. Some people in the kingdom don't want to walk through Pentecost. That's true. They want to leave it behind. They want to do, you know, that what they want is they want to separate the gifts of the Spirit from the fruit of the Spirit. 
And they want to say, well, we don't need the word of wisdom anymore, and we don't need to speak in tongues anymore, and we don't need to shout and dance, and we don't need all those things, because we've got love, joy, peace, you know, righteousness, goodness, temperance. We have what we need. Sounds a lot like the Laodicean church. We have what we need. Yeah. We don't need anymore. But the truth is, and then you got, I understand, and you've got a whole other group that functions in the gifts of the Spirit, but they're like the Corinthians. They speak in tongues all day and then fight all night. Yeah. They have no fruit of the Spirit. Very true. They want to just operate the gifts, and I don't care if I'm mean to you. I'm a prophet, and that's what I am. I'm just mean. Right. Can't help it. You know, I can't, I can't help it. It just, just comes out of me sometimes. Well, that's not what God intended. The whole fullness of the Spirit of God is to operate in the full gifts of the Spirit and the fruit, full fruit of the Spirit. When Jesus was on this earth, He was operating in the gifts of the Spirit and walking in the fruit of the Spirit. He was producing both. And if you're going to be a part of Pentecost, you've got to produce both. You can't go move on to new things and move on to the kingdom and think you don't have to have all the other two. Right. You need it all. And that is the way the sonship. See, you. The, what does the word say? It says that they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So you have to have, what does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? What does that mean? Well, it can mean that you need to make a decision, and so you go and you pray in the Spirit about it. Now, of course, for those that have left playing the Spirit behind, they can't do that. But... That is one meaning of being led by the Spirit of God. But Paul talks in another place, and he says, Be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. And in that be ye filled, the Greek meaning there means be, being continually filled. Be being filled. All the time. All the time, Holy Spirit. And that is the fullness of Pentecost. Even on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind, it said it filled all the house. All the house. Filled everything. Yeah. So to truly be a son of God, you have to be led of the Spirit of God. That means he gets it all. Yeah. He gets total fullness in you. He can do whatever he wants to do, and you go with it. That is swimming in waters that are over your head. Right. And you don't go where you want to go anymore, but you let the Holy Spirit, the river, take you wherever he wants to go. Yeah. And that's how you truly become a son of God. You can't do it another way. If you won't let Pentecost have its full work, the Holy Ghost do whatever He wants to do, anytime He wants to do it, anywhere He wants to do it, you can't walk in full sonship. Because Jesus said, I don't do anything except I see my Father do it. And I don't say anything except I hear my Father say it. He gave Him full reign. And He didn't care where He was, who was around, what was going on. He interrupted weddings, feasts, funerals, Wherever the Spirit of God said do it, he did it. He did it. And that is how you become a son of God. Whatever the Spirit of God says to do, you do it. Yes. Whatever you hear him say, you say it. And you don't worry about everybody around you or what's going on or circumstances. You just do it. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. Let's stand to worship.